I see in your eyes. The same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coel There will of course be disagreement and dissent regarding this announcement. But we are confident that ultimately, as we work through these disagreements, we will arrive at a peace and a place far greater in understanding and cooperation. Andrea, uh, you have been covering this uh, for so many decades now, and you know many of the key players, including Bibi Netanyahu, who uh, obviously had some very positive things to say just before and in the aftermath of this. Having said that, is there anybody in the Arab world who thinks that this could lead to peace? Is there anybody among our European allies who think that this is part of what the president said pretty offhandedly during the campaign, uh, that this would, could be much easier than people thought to solve the peace process in the Middle East? Frankly, no. Not in the Arab world, not in the European Union, not at NATO, not at the UN with the Secretary General today making a statement there. Uh, it's, it's hard to find anyone, not the Pope. He has spoken out. Uh, there is talk, the White House putting out the word that the Saudis are quietly supportive because they have been quietly supportive of many of the Israeli initiatives with a common enemy, Iran. But in fact, that's not the case, according to Arab and European diplomats who say, and I have also spoken with Arab leaders uh, in the region, who say that the Saudis uh, look at King Salman's very strong statement against this only yesterday, uh, it, are not supporting this. So whatever agreement from the Saudis that Jared Kushner may think that he got. Uh, It is not real and it is not uh, something that experienced diplomats believe is a legitimate endorsement of this from the powerful Saudi region, uh, certainly not from the UAE. Jordan is right in the the bullseye here. You've heard what al-Sisi in Cairo has to say. Turkey, Erdogan speaking out against it. Uh, China, President Xi. So this is a global reaction against the president from experienced diplomats who say it will not make it easier, it will make it harder, it will reinforce uh, the Palestinian concerns because any moderate leader, Abu Mazen, uh, known as uh, Mahmoud Abbas as well, is going to be now undercut uh, for having any negotiations in the past with Israelis and Americans. And it will reinforce the opposition, the Iranians, and certainly Hamas. 
It is Thursday, December 7th of 2017, a day that will live in infamy. That's right, folks, you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. My name is Justice Putnam. It is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. For our daily special, you've come to the right place, folks. That's right. West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is now open, and uh, we'll be serving up a cornucopia of abundance today. Every day there's more news than we can attend to. We we try to pick uh, ones that may have slipped under the radar or ones that are absolutely obvious, and one of those is Andrea Mitchell. Well, she essentially named every single world leader. And uh, none of them are very happy with uh, Trump's Mideast policy. What the hell? You know, for a guy who uh, you know has been a libertine his whole life, I guess he wants the apocalypse to happen. I mean, there are some white evangelicals who are very happy about this because it, uh, uh, it follows their myth of uh, their idea of renewal. Huh. I should mention that if you go to netrootsradio.com and you go to the bottom of the homepage there at netrootsradio.com, to the rightish, you will notice the chat room link and uh, you can communicate with us there. Rowing Girl uh, Kelly does uh, monitor the chat room link quite frequently during the day. And uh, but I should say, most importantly, to the leftish of the chat room link are the contribute donate buttons, and they are deftly located through superior graphic design to entice you. Well, you know, uh, to be generous in this uh, season of giving, as they say, uh, so that we can pay our bills and. Uh, yeah, I've been going over the bills, and yeah, we 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 have a, a baseline that we have to meet just to stay on the air, and uh, your generosity puts a big dent in that, and thank you so much uh, for doing that. All right. At the Front Cafe, uh, items on the menu will include uh, the pretzel logic Trump's solicitor general used to claim the KKK is a protected class. Yeah. They're in court, so a cake baker can discriminate, and somehow the KKK is now a protected class, is the argument. Hmm. Very interesting. The former Colorado GOP treasurer missed a court date for a $20,000 theft because he was arrested for a $100,000 fraud in El Salvador the day before. I wonder if he told him that, you can't arrest me now, I have a court date tomorrow. And two days, just two days after promising to help homeless vets, Trump's Veterans Affairs Secretary axes a popular and effective program that prevents veterans from ending up on the street. Well, that's how the Trump crew works, doesn't it? Well, then after the break, we'll move to the chef's table for an exploration of how weaponized outrage is a threat to free speech and the oldest and most distant black hole ever observed is providing scientists with some surprises of when the universe was first illuminated by starlight. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Now, this is uh, normally the point where I've uh, been offering up a few small plates of uh, headlines uh, before we get into the uh, main dishes on the menu for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, But I came across another audio clip that I'd like to share with you. I am not a big fan of Fox. I stay away from them. I never turn them on so that, uh, you know, they're not counted um, on on the cable. And uh, but uh, this clip uh, I came across uh, at Crooks and Liars, and it is of Judge Napolitano uh, basically uh, bursting the Fox bubble 
and uh, explaining why uh, the Mueller investigation is not fake news. So uh, why don't we uh, uh, take a listen to that, and I'll get these uh, uh, these other three dishes ready and bring them up in just a moment. Judge, you, you see the stories uh, about this uh, FBI agent who looks like he went rogue. His name is Peter Strzok. With, the, with every move that he has made in the last year under a microscope, what stands out in your mind as things that look biased where it shouldn't be? I'll tell you what's the most unusual, and, and good morning, everybody. I'll tell you what's the most unusual thing. When the FBI interrogated General Flynn in the White House on January 24, four days into his presidency, it already had transcripts of every one of the general's conversations with uh, Ambassador Kislyak, of which we now know there were five, mm -hmm. from the, between the day of the election and the day of the inauguration. So if they had the transcripts of those conversations, what was the purpose of interrogating the general? To, to trap him. him. To trap him, which they succeeded in doing. One of the interrogators Is that was, wrong, first off? On the premise, I heard you say the last thing. I'm one, is the premise of that wrong? In my personal view, yes, the government should not be in the business of trapping people. Supreme Court says it's OK, and the government does it all the time. Why would they do this to the president's principal foreign policy advisor? We didn't have a secretary of state at the time. General Flynn had been at the ear of Donald Trump since June of 2015 when Donald Trump announced he was running for president. So why would the FBI be in a position to do that? We don't know the answer to that. Flip side of this is the general used to be in charge of all the spies in the military. He was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Thousands of people running surveillance to keep America safe under him. How could he not know that the FBI had transcripts of these uh, conversations? So just as mysterious as is, why did the FBI interrogate him is, why didn't he tell the truth? Right. So what, the, about, what, the, what about this guy, though, uh, Peter Strzok, who changed in uh, the, uh, Comey's uh, uh, narrative about Hillary Clinton changed it from uh, grossly negligent to extremely careless because grossly negligent is criminal. Extremely, extremely careless. careless sounds a little softer. But if you ask a first year law student, what is the definition of gross negligence? The answer is extreme carelessness. Mm -hmm. They're really in the law is no different there. So if he changed this, Jim Comey still has to bear responsibility for it because he uttered mm -hmm. the statement. It wasn't statement it was a it was a spoken uh, statement and he's responsible for what he says even if somebody else drafted it for him but i have been arguing for 11 months now that the comey decision was wrong on the facts mm -hmm. wrong on the law and not his to make why doesn't jeff sessions see it that way yeah, why why does the president have to taunt the doj and the fbi instead of jeff sessions taking this evidence presenting it to a grand jury and letting the grand jury decide whether or not mrs clinton should be indicted for right. espionage i want to talk about peter struck for a second looks at what he's a part of this guy he's a part of the, the flynn setup would you say the trap uh he's part of looking at the thirty-five thousand emails on anthony weiner's laptop he's part of this gross negligence and the flipping of the the language he is also caught texting anti-trump views to his mistress on the side i have and then he's moved into human resources okay. who've heard of that okay i, I understand I understand the point, but I want to make two observations. I have never met an FBI agent that did not have a political opinion. These are smart, intelligent people. They work in the government. They, they have the same feelings the rest of us do. But if those opinions cloud your judgment or animate your judgment, you should be off the case. So when Jim Comey utilized the services of Peter Strzok, he stayed on the case. When Bob Mueller recognized what an advocate this guy was for one of the two sides, he got off the case. Yeah, yeah but not right away. Well, we don't know when Mueller learned this, and he's off the, and he's off the case. So now. these are some of the headlines this morning. Senator Blumenthal says, credible case for obstruction of justice against President Trump. Right. Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, I see obstruction of justice case forming against President okay, Trump. Okay, so obstruction of justice is the interference with a judicial proceeding or a law enforcement proceeding. Here's the key phrase, for a corrupt purpose. So if Donald Trump said to Jim Comey, back off of General Flynn. Mm -hmm. If he said that to Dan Coates, who runs National Intelligence, if he said it to Admiral Rogers, who runs the uh, NSA, and he did it because I feel sorry for General Flynn. He's, He's a been, buddy. Been through enough. That's not a corrupt purpose. Or 
The FBI has limited resources. They'd be better off chasing bank robbers and terrorists than chasing Mike Flynn. Mm -hmm. That's okay. But if the purpose was, I'm worried what beans Mike Flynn might spill about me or about somebody close to me, right. that's a corrupt but purpose. But it's impossible to get inside his head. Here's what Trey yeah. Gowdy said yesterday to that very question. About the memos. Yep. Of justice. Remember, that started being discussed when Comey had these memos that, that, that he said he, he, he made. I've read the memos. I've read every one of Comey's memos. They would be defense exhibit A in an obstruction of justice case, not prosecution exhibit, defense exhibit A. If Comey felt obstructed, he did a masterful job of keeping it out of any of his memos. It is the rare crime where you don't have to succeed. The obstructor doesn't have to succeed. He just has to attempt to interfere. What is in Donald Trump's mind? Who knows? It, it, it's up to what evidence surrounds his behavior from which a, a fact finder would infer what's in his mind. Well, because is obstruction of justice a crime? Of course it is. Is it an impeachable offense? Most lawyers and judges agree that it well, is. Well, it's starting to put doubt in people's minds as to whether or not the FBI can administer a fair investigation. So Christopher Wray, who's now the director of the FBI, he sent a memo right. to all of his employees to try to boost morale. And this is what it said. Please continue to keep focused on our critical mission with fidelity, bravery, and integrity. The American people rightly expect this from us. Keep calm and tackle hard. Now, knowing Chris Ray, my, my guess is that he actually is speaking to people who have strong political views. That's a very nice thing to say, but that's going to go in one ear and out the other of the thousands of FBI agents. But if there are FBI agents involved in these politically sensitive investigations, they're not yeah. prosecutions yet, you have to find out whether the politics is interfering the professional judgment if the politics is interfering with clouding or animating the professional judgment the person needs to be transferred to, to another investigation you can certainly have a strong political opinion but it can't be on the front burner as you make law enforcement decisions well, right. well i'll tell you wall street journal today at lead editorial they have a major problem with the Mueller investigation especially how slow he moved to move him out as well as uh being uh, obstructive when it comes to devin nunez's intelligence committee well that is another strange relationship. These things are not supposed to happen when the same political party runs Congress as runs the White House and the executive branch. Mm -hmm. Who ever heard of a Republican Congress holding a Rod Republican Rose. FBI director yeah. or a Republican de appointed deputy attorney general in contempt? The president should pick up a phone call and say, pick up the phone and say, give them the documents. All right, let's uh, tuck into the first dishes uh, on the menu here at the front cafe. And uh, we'll start off with a story out of Raw Story by Noor al Sabai. In the circus surrounding the Masterpiece Bake Shop case, in which a Colorado baker refused to serve gay customers, lost a discrimination case, and then appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court, a strange tidbit emerged on Tuesday in explaining why Jack Phillips the bakery's owner should not be compelled to serve people whose lifestyles go against his religious beliefs. Solicitor General Noel Francisco kept saying that a black sculptor should not be compelled to make art for the Ku Klux Klan. Hmm. Well, as Amani, Amani Gandhi at Rewire pointed out, Francisco, who serves as the government's lawyer, got at least one half of his argument right. No lawyer could successfully argue that it's discriminatory for an African-American artist to deny service to a KKK member. But that's because, unlike LGBTQ people, KKK members are not members of a protected class. Now, I would think that in the KKK's mind, and maybe in the Solicitor General here, in his mind, that since white people are the most discriminated against society, against, in society, and and if you're like a white Christian, you're discriminated even more. So how can white people, especially white Christians, wearing hoods, not be a protected class? Everybody hates them. 
Amani continues, uh, the anti-discrimination law doesn't require every business to serve every person on the planet. It merely requires that a business not refuse service based on a person's protected characteristic. And apparently the argument by the Solicitor General is that since everybody hates the KKK and <laughs> and their, uh, their characteristic is, you know, one that's makes people hate them that means they're discriminated against they have to be protected god maybe i should be a lawyer under colorado's anti-discrimination law places of public accommodation like businesses restaurants stores and hotels are not permitted to refuse service to someone based on protected characteristics well they think that if you wear a pointed hood You've identified yourself as being a hateful white supremacist and everybody hates you. Protect me. But unfortunately, the characteristics that are under the anti-discrimination law include disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, and ancestry. I guess they could argue that since they are descended from, I don't know, generations of white supremacists that everybody hates, they should be protected too. A protected or suspect class, Amani Gandhi continues, is made up of discrete and insular minorities, a group of people who have historically been subjected to discrimination comprise a discrete minority, meaning there are not a lot of them percentage-wise, and have immutable characteristics, meaning characteristics that cannot be changed. So I guess white supremacists could be changed, and so therefore they're not protected. But being a member of the Klan or other bigoted groups, see, is not unchangeable, nor does it subject one to historic discrimination, no matter what racist white wingers would have you believe and apparently racist white people would have you believe a lot as evidenced by well the solicitor general's pretzel logic in twisting the law hmm. well that's what they do okay uh this next article served up here in the front cafe on metro shrimp and grits thursday by the way is also by Noor al Sabai out of Raw Story. Jeff Fogg, who formerly served as the treasurer for Colorado's Pueblo County Republicans, missed his November 16th court date in the state for charges that he spent $20,000 of the party's funds. But as a new report reveals... He was arrested just one day after missing that date in El Salvador under suspicion for a second and much larger fraud charge. According to the Pueblo chieftain, Fogg was arrested on November 17th in San Salvador, El Salvador under suspicion for a $100,000 fraud. As the chieftain notes, the former treasurer owns property in the Central American country. Well, that's convenient if you think you're going to be able to skip town and, I don't know, skip right out of the country and parachute into, I don't know, a place where no one knows your name. Apparently they knew his name. Due to missing his court date, a bench warrant was issued for Fogg, whose trial is supposed to begin December 11th. His Colorado charges center on accusations from the Pueblo County Republicans that he misused the party credit card and stole somewhere between $20,000 and $100,000 between April of 2013 and July of 2015. Now, I don't know. I've done a little bit of bookkeeping before. And uh, somewhere between twenty and a hundred thousand. Come on, that's quite a gap. I yeah. Okay. What I want to know is what is the one hundred thousand dollar fraud charge that he? What what did he fraud uh, El Salvador over? Hmm. The Pueblo chieftain uh, doesn't specify. All right. 
uh, seems like, I don't know, maybe you want to be like a party treasurer, especially a Republican one. I, I've been reading a lot of, uh, and it's not relegated to just Republican treasurers. There's been a few uh, Democratic ones, too, but it uh, seems like the vast majority are Republicans and uh, r- running the, the books for these county and state uh, parties and uh, absconding with lots and lots and lots of money. Well, uh, they'll be dragging Jeff Fogg back to uh, uh, Colorado uh, you know, as soon as he serves his time in yee, a jail in El Salvador. All right, the uh, last dish that we have here in the front cafe on Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. You know, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Matthew Chapman from Share Blue Media. Donald Trump, from the outset, cast himself as a champion of veterans and promised that he would improve veterans' care as president. But the toxic right-wing ideology of Trump and his administration has none the bless seeped into the way they take care and prioritize veterans. A popular program to house homeless veterans is on the chopping block and at the worst possible moment. Four days after uh, Veteran Affairs Secretary David Shulkin held a big Washington event to tout the Trump administration's promise to house all homeless vets. The agency did an about-face telling advocates it was pulling resources from a major housing program. The VA said it was essentially ending a special $460 million program that has dramatically reduced homelessness among chronically sick and vulnerable veterans. Instead... The money would go to local VA hospitals that can use it as they like as long as they show evidence of dealing with homelessness. Yeah, we had some homeless uh, guys uh, sitting in the uh, ER waiting room for about 12 hours today. Then we kicked them out because, you know, I mean, they were just sitting there. (sighs) Anger exploded on a December 1 call that was arranged by Shulkin's Advisory Committee on Homeless Veterans to explain the move. Advocates for veterans, state officials, and even officials from HUD, which co-sponsors the program, attacked the decision, according to five people who were on the call. Shulkin's decision makes absolutely no sense. The move does not save money since the funding would simply be routed to other facilities. The effect is that it would just be used far less efficiently and many more homeless veterans will be forced out into the street. From what I've been able to gather, now this is just anecdotal, mind you, is that this specific administration does not want anything running efficiently because If it's running efficiently, it's harder to deconstruct the administrative state. Jeez. The people in this program are the most vulnerable individuals, Matt Leslie, who runs the housing program for the Virginia Department of Veterans Services, said. If someone's going to die in the streets, they are the ones. To make matters even worse, a report released yesterday shows... And that was, uh, of course, Wednesday shows that the population of homeless veterans increased in 2017, the first time it has done so in seven years. And this is only the most recent of Trump's assaults on veteran care. The callousness and insincerity of the Trump administration's effort to help those Americans who served is simply another reminder that Trump only values their sacrifices when they are useful props, from attacking Gold Star families to using a racial slur in front of Native American World War II heroes, Trump's regard for the military changes on a dime. I don't know. I think it might be a few million rubles, too, but that's just me. All right. Well, let's uh, get to uh, our break here. We need to break actually break down the... Uh, front cafe because we're moving everything back to the chef's table for a little in-depth conversation there 
So uh, stay with us through the break, and uh, we'll be back in just a few moments. You're listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. The Trump tax plan is not selling well. Indeed, two-thirds of the American people oppose it, and only 16% believe it would reduce their tax bill. But wait, say Trump and his congressional trumpeteers. We're really trying to help you commoners. How? By killing the death tax. So when you die, your estate can go to your heirs without that inheritance being taxed. As the president so eloquently put it, to protect millions of small businesses and the American farmer, we are finally ending the crushing, the horrible, the unfair estate tax. Hooray! Donald is saving us! Actually, no. The great majority of Americans don't own farms, businesses, or big estates of any kind. So that tax doesn't even apply to us. Also, 99% of the people who do have farms and businesses are already exempt from the tax, since it only applies to estates worth $5.5 million or more. I realize that Trump prefers grandiose claims over actual facts, but here are a few reality checks showing that his statement is not just a lie, It's a whopper. This year, a mere two-tenths of one percent of American families will inherit enough money to owe any estate tax. That's only about 11,000 families, not millions, as Trump so theatrically proclaimed. As for protecting our nation's family farm and small business estates from taxation, only 80 of those are big enough to be subject to the tax this year. So who exactly is Trump saving from having to pay some taxes on their multi-million dollar estates? The richest 0.2% of American families, including one named Trump. This is Jim Hightower saying killing the estate tax lets a handful of elites, the richest of the richest, escape from paying more than $20 million each. And that's what the Trump plan really is all about. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on December 6th, 2017. I'm Mark Belanger. There are about 21 million people in the world trapped in modern-day slavery, forced labor. Women and girls are disproportionately affected, accounting for 99% of victims in the commercial sex industry and 58% in other sectors. To fight forced labor, member countries of the UN's International Labor Organization have adopted a new international regulation called a protocol to eliminate forced labor. The ILO is the organization which creates international laws and methods of implementing those laws which its member states can adopt. The protocol on forced labor has come into force, which means if a country adopts it, the protocol becomes part of the nation's legal infrastructure. Guy Ryder, a trade unionist, is the director general of the ILO. The ILO forced labor protocol has entered into force. It requires countries to take effective measures to prevent and eliminate forced labor, and to protect and provide access to justice for victims. The labor movement is a prime mover in the fight against forced labor. Sharon Burrow is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. The protocol is legally binding. That means the more governments that ratify and ensure it is implemented, the closer we'll be to eliminating slavery once and for all. Beate Andres is the chief of the Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work branch of the ILO. Forced labor is any type of work or service uh, where people are coerced. 
they work under conditions that they have not freely chosen, and then they cannot leave uh, without losing, for instance, their salary, or without being threatened, uh, or without being um, restricted to, to actually leave the place where they are. Some people call this modern-day slavery, others call it trafficking, but it's all captured by this notion of, of forced labor. It also includes uh, prostitution or forced begging. It doesn't have to be formal work. Um, it can be any type of, of service. According to our most recent estimates, we think that there are about 21 million men, women and children trapped in forced labor, meaning they cannot really leave the situation. They are severely abused and exploited um, in different sectors. In absolute number, Asia is the region that is most affected by slavery or forced labor, in particular bonded labor. Um, we think that more than 11 million victims are in Asia. And then Africa is another region that is very much affected, uh, followed by Latin America, the Middle East, and industrialized countries. The main sectors are agriculture in many, especially in developing countries, but also in industrialized countries. Uh, we also see a lot of forced labor in domestic work or care work, in the entertainment industry, of course, in construction and in manufacturing. As a consumer, uh, you can contribute by just asking some more questions, where your T-shirt is coming from or under what conditions the person working, helping you in your household uh, is actually employed. And then you can also write letters to your uh, deputy or to the government to ask for more effective action. That has an impact as well. And finally, there are many groups, community groups all over the world that have been created to actually take direct action to assist victims and to raise awareness. You can join these groups. Victims are found in every region of the world. 90% are exploited in the private economy and 44% of all victims have migrated internally or across borders. Forced labor generates 150 billion U.S. dollars in illicit profits annually. Industries and businesses face unfair competition, and states lose billions in tax income and social security contributions. This new legal instrument provides much-needed guidance on how to eliminate all forms of forced labor and sanction perpetrators, including in the identification protection, rehabilitation of victims and their access to justice and remedies. So far, 21 countries have ratified the ILO Protocol on Forced Labour, including the UK and Sweden. Countries such as Canada, China and the United States have not. And that's it. International labour news you can use. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Labour. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From Washington, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. The State Department is warning American citizens in Israel to avoid crowds. Hours ahead of President Trump's announcement that the U.S. will recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Government employees are subject to a more strict ban on all travel into Palestine or Jerusalem's old city. The Palestinian militant group Hamas has called on its supporters to hold a day of rage on Friday protest the U.S. policy shift. As of press time on Wednesday, only isolated protests had been reported in the West Bank cities of Hebron and Bethlehem. Pope Francis has now weighed in on Trump's Jerusalem announcement, saying he couldn't hide his, quote, deep concern for the situation that has been created in the last few days. The Pope went on to acknowledge that Jerusalem is a sacred city for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And the International Olympic Committee has barred Russia from competing in the upcoming Winter Olympics in South Korea. That announcement follows a years-long investigation into Russian state-sponsored doping efforts at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. That investigation unearthed a coordinated effort by Russian officials to swap out tainted urine samples. According to the IOC's ruling, Russia will officially receive zero medals during February's Pyeongchang Olympics, even if individual Russian athletes are cleared to compete in select sports under a neutral flag. And the British government has not calculated the financial cost of leaving the European Union. That announcement on Wednesday by Brexit Minister David Davis has incensed critics of the Brexit process, who argue that Theresa May's government isn't taking seriously the potential risks to Britain's economy. 
Davis contends releasing a detailed economic analysis could weaken Britain's negotiating position with the European Union. For more global news headlines, visit talkmedianews.com. So we moved everything uh, back here to the chef's table, and uh, thank you for accompanying us. Uh, you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. My name is Justice Putnam. We do this uh, five days a week uh, for about an hour-ish uh, in this time period, uh, Monday through Friday. And today's uh, daily special, of course, is uh, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. So um, why don't we take a look at local and world weather. So let me just bring that up real quick. Don't ask me why I didn't have the tab open already, but it's opening now. All right, so let's see. Well, finally, uh, my list of uh, cities around the world are is showing in the proper part of the banner. So I've had to do a workaround to get that, and they finally fixed uh, the webpage here at the Weather Underground. And thank you for doing that, folks. So uh, today, along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, it is currently 25 degrees, and it is crusty out there. Yes, we have a crust of white everywhere, and I kind of like it. It's like winter time is here. And uh, though we are going to, uh, whoa, we're going to get up to about 58 degrees, uh, winds will be light and variable out of the north. Is that right? Yes, light and variable out of the north-northeast. Uh, though they will, and light and variable means something less than three miles per hour. Though we will be getting uh, a bit stiffer winds later on in the day. And uh, around four o'clock, as it normally happens, and there is it's going to be about five to ten miles per hour then. And uh, tonight we are forecast a low of 35, though I think we're going into the 20s again. And uh, we will be dry for at least the next five to seven days. And uh, but I expect snow is going to be coming soon. Air quality uh, is good on the index at 45 parts per million. Uh, pressure is holding at 30.49 inches, visibility 9 miles, and humidity is 63%. Oh, I should mention, Los Angeles is burning up. Oh, my God. I have friends down there, uh, just in, in right there. Uh, the Hollywood Bowl's uh, being threatened. Uh, the Getty Museum. There's also a big dump in between those two that uh, you don't want to be burning up either. Eee. All right. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they have purchased. And these people live around the world. London is 47 and fair. Paris is 44 and cloudy. Rome is 56 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 34 with light rain. Kabul is 38 degrees with smoke. Now, I'm presuming uh, they're burning wood because it's cold. Hong Kong is 67 and fair. Tokyo is 42 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 70 and clear. San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and clear. And New York, New York is 42 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they have purchased. And these people live around the world. All right. So as I was uh, picking out this morning's uh, read for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday, uh, while I was doing that, uh, some new news has just been breaking here earlier this morning. 
and uh, while we've been on air, and I missed this. It happened a little bit of a go, but it looks like MSNBC has reversed course on their decision to fire Sam Cedar, and they have reinstated him after a furious backlash, which I am proud to admit I was a part of as well. And uh, it just so happens that uh, the article I chose earlier to go over uh, here in, at the chef's table uh, is is right in the wheelhouse of this Sam Cedar uh, scandal. I don't know what to else to call it because Sam Cedar is not the only one who has come under, uh, well, being put in the barrel, so to speak, by the rat fuckers in Roger Stone's shop and uh, the Pepe uh, Nazis generally. So this is out of the New Republic uh, by Jeet here. Activists on the right and left are exploiting sensitivity over sexual misconduct and other issues, and it is seriously undermining journalism. The tweet was clearly meant to scare me. Jack Prosbiak, an alt-right bottom feeder best known for promoting the Pizzagate and Seth Rich conspiracy theories, issued this ominous warning on November 25th. It will soon be heat j- or hear jeets. Time in the barrel. Hear jeets. Time in the barrel. At hear, hear jeet. And Prospiak is an ally of the notorious Roger Stone, famed for his political dirty tricks. We call that rat fucking, actually. And that's, that's a professional term. Dirty tricks. But when Roger Stone does dirty tricks, it's called rat fucking. And uh, the tweet echoed the phrase time in a barrel, which Stone had tweeted prior to scandals breaking out about Democratic Party bigwig John Podesta and Senator Al Franken. I wondered what Prosobiak could possibly have on me. The most shocking thing about my emails is my tardiness in answering them. I have hundreds of orphan missives in my drafts folder. My sex life, for better or worse, is hardly tabloid material, and I have never sexually harassed anyone. Maybe Prosbiak, being a fabulist, was planning on inventing a lurid tale of depraved behavior? Prosbiak's uh, smear job, which came a few days later, was weak tea. He had dug up some tweets I had written in 2014 and 2016, offering a partial defense of conservative political scientist Tom Flanagan, and fired Nintendo employee Allison Rapp, both of whom had heterodox opinions on child pornography in my tweets. I argued that the law should distinguish between child porn, that is a work of the imagination where no one is harmed in the production, and child porn that is a work of reproduction where actual children are hurt. That possession of child porn might best be dealt with through therapy rather than jail, and that Flanagan and Rapp shouldn't be fired for arguing for changes in child porn laws. Prospiak spun this into a defense of child porn and argued that I was a hypocrite for criticizing Alabama senatorial candidate Roy Moore, who faces multiple credible accusations of child molestation. We live in an age of weaponized outrage, where bad faith actors use out-of-context statements to get people fired. But I had little to fear from Prospiak's attack. Not just because he was attacking perfectly reasonable opinions, I was also safe because my employer, the New Republic, is secure in its identity as a journal of opinion and has owners who can recognize a right-wing character assassination when they see it. But Sam Cedar hasn't been so lucky. Though there is that update. Uh, So this was written, obviously, before the breaking news this morning. An NBC contributor, he was a target of a mudslinging campaign by alt-right media personality Mike Cernovich, a Prosbiak ally and fellow Pizzagate fabricator. The campaign against Cedar followed the same script as Prosbiak's smear job against me. Heat jeer digging up an old tweet and accusing Cedar of alleged hypocrisy for criticizing Roar Moore. And President Donald Trump, we don't say president here in Netroots Radio, excuse me, Donald Trump, for their sexual offenses. But Cedar's bosses at MS, 
NBC did not stand by him, revealing an increasing danger to free speech in the age of the Internet troll. Now, I will say that MSNBC has reversed course because is it possible that they didn't know who Cernovich is? Is that possible? Huh. Well, one of the Nixon kids did bring in uh, the Jefferson Airplane to the White House for a concert, and uh, it didn't go well for Richard, let's put it that way. So maybe, maybe they could have snuck the guy through, those kids. Okay, and what had happened is that uh, uh, in 2009, many mainstream voices, and most notably Washington Post columnist Ann Applebaum and Richard Cohen, defended Roman Polanski against rape accusations, arguing that he was a victim of judicial misconduct, and noting that the victim, who was 13 years old at the time, of the rape had forgiven Polanski. And Cedar really went off on those people. He took them to task. They were apologists for a child rapist, and there's no other way of getting around it. A 13-year-old cannot forgive. I don't care if she's 40 or 50 when she finally forgives. She was 13 at the time. No way. And Sam Cedar in a sarcastic tweet, mocked Applebaum and Richard Cohen, and Cernovich turned that around, that tweet, and went to MSNBC and said, Sam Cedar advocates uh, child rape. I mean, he's offering up his own daughter. Look at this tweet. Okay, well... One big problem, as CNN's Andrew Kaczynski notes, is that the management of large media operations are not familiar with how social media works. Executives, editors, and corporate media uh, need to understand the bad faith actions here and world of social media better, Kaczynski tweeted. Part of the problem here could be people like the executives at NBC, MSNBC don't even understand what was going on because they don't even operate in the same world as many of these people. And until these executives and editors do understand the world of social media, charlatans like Cernovich will exploit the newfound sensitivity to sexual harassment to limit free speech. Now, remember, uh, you know, one of the Nazi tactics is to blame your opponent with what you were guilty of. Roy Moore, obviously, uh, pursuing young girls when he was in his 30s. Because, you know, there was none left. All of them got married when he was off in the military. And you also might argue that he was looking for girls who didn't know any better. Because the ones that did, didn't want to go out with Roy Moore. But uh, you take that accusation. Uh, any number of accusations of sexual misconduct on the right. And you throw that against the left. And see what sticks. Even if they're out and out lies like Cernovich's fraud. Well, good on MSNBC for seeing through that and reinstating Sam Cedar. All right, the uh, last dish that we are serving up here uh, at the chef's table is uh, Out of Reuters by Will Dunham about a colossal distant black hole that holds surprises about the early universe. The oldest and most distant black hole ever observed, a celestial brute, 800 million times more massive than the sun, is providing scientists some surprises about the nature of the universe when, on a cosmic scale, it was a mere toddler. Astronomers yesterday said the black hole, residing at the center of a highly luminous celestial object called a quasar, is located about 13.1 billion light-years away from Earth. The quasar's light, detected by the researchers, dates back to about 690 million years, after the Big Bang that created the universe when the cosmos was only 5% of its present age. 
So if the universe was a 50-year-old person, uh, we're seeing a picture of that person when he or she was two and a half years old, said astronomer Eduardo Banados of the Carnegie Institution for Science, who led the research published in the journal Nature. When we're looking at f- further distances, we're also looking back in time because of the time it takes for light to travel across the universe, Banados added. That means this object dates back 13.1 billion years. By way of comparison, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. The newly detected quasar, designated as J1342 plus 0928, existed during a fundamental shift in the nature of the early universe when it was moving from its dark ages, with no light emitted, into a time of luminosity as gravity condensed matter into the very first stars. This object provides us with a measurement of time at which the universe first became illuminated with starlight, said another of the researchers, physics professor Robert Semko of MIT and uh, MIT's Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. Finding such a large black hole existing so early in the universe's history surprised the researchers. Its very existence at that point in time challenges current notions about the formation and growth of such objects, they said. The universe is is full of surprises, Magnato said. Indeed it is. Quasars, energized by gases spiraling at high speeds into an enormous black hole, are known to inhabit the center of certain galaxies, like the Milky Way, by the way, folks. Just saying. Sometimes outshining all the stars in those galaxies. In black holes, gravity has such a strong pull that not even light can escape. And this black hole was seen devouring material at the center of a galaxy. Now, this is what's surprising to me. The object was studied using ground-based telescopes in Chile and Hawaii and NASA's orbiting wild field infrared survey explorer, otherwise known as WISE. Hmm. Just the idea that ground-based telescopes were able to get an image from that far away, is uh, that, that surprises me. All right, so we have come to... Yes, indeed. We have come to the end of our broadcast uh, period for today here at the uh, Chef's Table and West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we hope you join us tomorrow because it's Friday and it's Blue Moon Spirits Friday. Uh, I wonder what we're serving up there. Well, uh, we ought to know uh, about Al Franken's future in the Senate. If he's not giving the speech now, uh, he will soon. And uh, so we'll check into that uh, tomorrow and see where that goes. And uh, but uh, and stay tuned to Netroots Radio 24-7, 365. So please join us tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux 
déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts T'en mange à d'un verre Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie d'un novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de retendre Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 